Location, location, location. Long the hallmark of real estate investment, it's now a rallying cry for data. So-called geospatial data refers to data that's relevant to a specific location. Knowing how to leverage such data, especially in near real time, can be a boon for the savvy business person. Find out more on this episode of Future Proof. The future is here already. It's just not evenly distributed. Yet. Today's world teams with innovation. The nexus of hardware, software, and human ingenuity promises a revolution in possibilities. What does tomorrow look like? Witness Future Proof. Yours truly, Eric Cavanaugh here, burning right through another year. We're in year 16 of DM Radio, doing this for a long time. And uh, things change and things stay the same. Uh, but today we're going to talk about one of the harder nuts to crack. We're going to talk about geospatial data, how it can be used, when it can be used, why it can be used, what it can do, and what the architecture is like, and uh, and maybe why it's such a hard nut to crack. So we're going to be hearing from uh, Neymar Negaban. He is the CEO of a company called Kinetica. And our good buddy uh, Eugene Burke is with us as well, a consultant, practitioner, budding analyst in the space. We'll talk about what you can do with this stuff and again, why it matters. So first I'll just say a couple quick words. There are lots of different database types out there. Most people know relational databases. Most people know tables, Excel spreadsheets and things of that nature. You also have like an access database, right? Which has its own sort of three dimensional hierarchy. And you have graph databases that have really taken off in the last few years, largely because of folks like Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram and all these guys who are trying to understand relationships between people. Who do you know that this other person also knows? If you go to LinkedIn and you go to connect with someone, it'll show you who you're connected with that they're connected with. So that's an interesting piece of information to go, okay, well, maybe I should connect with this person. They may know something I need to know. That's another kind of database. Uh, there are document databases. There are key value stores, for example, which really like two column databases. So there are lots of different kinds of database because there are lots of different needs for that. I actually remember interviewing Dr. Michael Stonebreaker in the year 2005. He was on this big push called uh, One Size Does Not Fit All. And his point was that column oriented databases are very good for analytics because everything in the column is supposed to be the same. And that's good for compression purposes. So mm -hmm. there are lots of reasons why you would have different database architectures and styles. And one of them to our show today is geospatial. And with that, Nima Negabon of Kinetica, tell us a bit about Kinetica, why you chose to focus on geospatial and what you're doing that really makes geospatial analysis easy. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, I think um, it, it's best explained kind of talking about our, our origin story. So we, we came out of the DOD and uh, the goal of, of this research program that we were on was to consume, you know, over 200 different real time feeds, a lot of them geospatial, right. Um, and, you know, at the time, this is like 2010, uh, like NoSQL is all the rage, you know, Hadoop is all the rage. Um, and they wanted to give a common query capability to analysts, developers, so that they could make, you know, uh, location intelligence to give to people uh, out in the field. Um, and, and basically, you know, the problems we saw were like, you know, very poor query latency times because location is compute intensive quite often, right? Um, data latency problems because, you know, in this case, you know, and, and this is, you know, for location, you know, pretty common, there's a real time element. You've got a stream of sensor readings, you know, flowing in, right? Um, and then very limited query flexibility, right? Because, you know, the kind of classic indexing approaches uh, only go so far, right? Right. Um, and on top of that, you know, let's say you could get a query run, query to run, you know, the DOD was ahead of this because they had more data, but now, you know, everyone's kind of got this problem. When you've got a lot of spatial data to visualize the kind of client server model where, you know, the server returns back a huge payload for the browser to, to try to render, it just doesn't work and you get a spinning wheel and your, your browser crashes. So, you know, uh, we really thought about, okay, how do we solve this problem? Well, first, you know, we saw that, you know, the GPU and the CPU are just completely different than how databases were designed, you know, 30 years ago, as far as the common algorithms yes. and data structures. So, you know, we really thought about, okay, we we're going to make a, a database that fully reimagines all the data structures and algorithms to, to leverage many core devices, right? Um, and we're going to, you know, make it to be optimized to, to leverage compute so that data can continuously flow in. Uh, so you don't have, you have simplified data structures 
and you have the compute horsepower to do to do these kind of uh, uh, compute intensive queries that location often involves, right? Um, you know, it's a high cardinality. It's not easily indexed. It's not easily uh, rolled up. Um, and you know, this is something where we wanted to give that capability in a, in a data model that was intuitive for the developers. So, like you know, even though you know we're a you know time series and spatial engine, it's still you're, you're interacting with tables, right? You make tables, you insert rows. Um, so, you know, with that vision, you know, we started to build uh, Kinetica um, and, you know, it's it's really about having an engine that's, you know, uh, uh, kind of primed and ready to take advantage of modern horsepower, right? And, you know, being able to take on advanced location queries means, you know, yes, you can do indexing a little bit and there's been you know, newer methods like H3 that help a little bit, but when you're looking at really, you know, kind of enterprise location intelligence, it, it takes it takes the ability to leverage that compute horsepower to do what to do what you need, and then um, it can also kind of cross analytic modalities. Like so, um, there's lo like kind of 2D location, but then there's also you know lidar and 3D, and then there's also kind of uh, like you were alluding to graph right so you know being able to kind of cross those worlds um to be able to drive um you know a a uh, intelligence use case for someone who, who might be doing connected car or doing you know uh fleet visibility for you know uh, a fleet that's you know consists of like thousands or hundreds of thousands of vehicles right yeah that's very useful stuff and these are as a kind of leaning into this unwieldy use cases right when you have lots of vehicles that are all over the place and this is why iot is i think kind of a challenge and why there doesn't still seem to be one vendor at the top of the iot game maybe i'm missing something but there are lots and lots of companies doing iot ibm of course has stuff lots of the big guys have some offering in that space but it's highly varied in terms of the objects that are out there at the edge that you're trying to track. It's highly varied in terms of the sensors that you use to keep tabs on things. So there are all these different component parts that have to come together. And then you have to be able to see it and look at it in right. some meaningful way. And that's probably one of the hardest parts. What do you think? No, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that kind of got us going uh, as a product was uh, our, our visualization engine. So yes, we can do the feature rendering, like putting the points or shapes on a map, but also doing like heat, heat maps, right? So, you know, having the server side rendering do heat maps or like class break renderings. So you can kind of get a visual understanding of what's going on. Um, and it's kind of a visual analytic, right? So, you know, with, with spatial, there's, you know, a lot of uh, senses that need to be kind of interacted with, uh, with the user, right? Like it's, it's visual, um, it's, it's structured with the data that's get, that's getting returned. Uh, there's a performance aspect to it as well, where if you're doing analysis and it comes back hours, you know, takes hours, that doesn't really work. You need to have right. performance there as well. So um, it's a it's a tricky use case. And, you know, I think for a long time, kind of location has been, I don't know, like a second class citizen where um, there just hasn't been uh, as much of a prevalence of it, I guess, you know, across kind of commercial enterprise. And, you know, that's that's changing, you know, yes, with IoT, but also with, um, you know, uh, just the uh, the amount of uh, like real time capability that enterprises have now, you know, they've had these sensors for a long time, but now they're actually saying we're, we're going to capture them and, you know, we're going to try to analyze this and, and understand and get kind of that that visibility that, that is going to give us that extra, you know, 10, 20 percent of efficiency. That's interesting. I'll ask you another question that I'll throw it over to Eugene uh, to dive in here. But I'm curious to understand in, in the execution and the runtime, if you will, I'm sure there are lots of ways you can do this. There's certain data you're going to persist. There's certain data you're going to keep in like an intelligent cache somewhere. And then there's functionality you're going to want to apply at different points along that way to say, okay, what's happening? Or can I predict what will happen next if this is the motion of everything? And you mentioned graph already. So graph is part of your architecture. But can you kind of talk about you know, how you pull, just maybe give one quick use case, how you pull the data in, then how you pre, maybe pre-process it, validate it, uh, deliver it to the user. Can you walk us through sort of the step-by-step -step process of how this can sometimes work? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, usually there's kind of, I mean, for, you know, a, a lot of big use cases, there's the referential data, right? That's gonna, that might be like your road network and that lives on, on the graph. And then you're gonna have your sensor data that's gonna be your continuous flow, right? Um, so, you know, Step one is 
you know, make sure your referential data is prepped and ready to go. And you, with Kinetica, you know, with, like with other databases, you can write, you know, data cleansing jobs. Um, but then uh, once the sensor data starts flowing in, you know, then we, you know, we have things where we can do things like map matching, like snapping breadcrumbs to uh, el elements of the road network or, um, you know, giving uh, location intelligence operators to, you know, basically make sure that that sensor data has got, uh, it's denoised, right? So um, once you have that real time element to be able to make sure it's, you know, making sense and make sure that you can, you know, quickly query it and understand it, um, the location, you know, uh, kind of characteristics we've talked about, it makes it tricky. But, you know, again, with our architecture, we focused on you've got this high compute engine, you've got, you know, internally this uh, data model that combines columnar uh, with, with, you know, a kind of very lightweight graph representation to let you mix and match between these different worlds. Uh, we also have, you know, a, a 3D representation for LIDAR that uh, is coming out next year. So, um, you know, I think with location, it kind of always goes back to, do you have the horsepower to muscle through? Um, right. It also goes into, do you have kind of the analytic robustness to you know go between these different worlds yeah that's cool stuff eugene i'll, I'll pull you in i'm sure you got some questions you want to ask go ahead i have tons but one clarifying question for the the reasonably informed business participant can you explain why the basically the difference between cpu and gpu and why this seems to be the foundation of how you're achieve, you're able to achieve the kind of the astonishing throughput that you are. Yeah, so, you know, at, at this point, you know, uh, we actually have really great performance with the CPU as well, but, you know, fundamentally the the GPU is just a, a very layman's perspective. It's just got, instead of, you know, 40 cores, it's, you know, 400 or now it's, you know, in the thousands of cores, right? So. When you have that many cores that are, you know, all a little, you know, not a little bit, but there, there's many more of them, but they're not as capable as, as the CPU core. Um, how do you structure, you know, everything to take advantage of that type of device, right? Um, and that's where, uh, you know, you kind of need to structure things in uh, just kind of different ways to make sure you can kind of take advantage of the of the hardware parallelism that 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 that, that device gave. And and you know, now the CPU. It's, it's got, you know, you've got 100 core CPUs, uh, you know, 92 core CPUs, but you know, obviously the GPU is still, you're talking thousands of cores. So, um, you know, to be able to take advantage of a device like that, you have to make sure you've structured not just your data, but like your actual algorithms um, in just, you know, entirely different ways that are don't kind of fit the, the you know, your college computer science textbook. So to boil it down, what we learned in data warehousing two decades, three decades ago, row and column, row and column, row and column, is now a different way of arranging the data to optimize the way the query performs. And you're throwing tons, tons more power at that query and paralyzing, parallelizing the query, correct? And the kernel itself is different, right? So like our join algorithms, our join kernels or our group by kernels are, are just completely different than like, you know, your standard hash join approaches and, and things like mm -hmm. that. So um, you, you need to do both. And, um, you know, I, with uh, with with uh, that kind of investment, uh, and it, it did take a while, um, you know, you do start to see some pretty great outperformance. Like, so, um, when queries are simple, like it's a simple select, you know, we do fine. I mean, it's not that, it's not that like, you know, there's no big wow factor compared to you know what you might expect with anything else. But when you have something that's more complicated, maybe a three-way join or high cardinality group buys, um, like something like a TPC DS might, might deliver as far as computational intensity, that's when we really outperform, right? Because you can't fall back on simple indexes or, um, you know, uh, you know pre-aggregated results um, and you have to really be able to have the algorithms and data structures to take advantage of that, of that modern compute. Talking all things geospatial data, we've got Nema Negaban from Connecticut and our buddy Eugene Burke from the consulting world these days. He's got his own company that he's uh, stood up there. He's doing some work with 
some other interesting folks out there in, uh, in the medical field. He's been focused for a number of years. But we're talking about geospatial, why it's different, why you should care. And uh, you, know, you, you brought up a couple good points, Nima, and then I'll throw it back over to Eugene in a second. But you, know, you want an experience for the developers that they can work with. You want an experience for the business people that they can work with. And that's the hard part, right? I mean, there's number crunching that happens in these engines, but then how you deliver that and how they work with it, that's really important stuff to be able to get stuff done and know what to do and where to go and not be looking at a command prompt all day. So maybe talk quickly about the interface and how you're able to enable those folks to do this stuff and we'll go from there. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we really try to take a standard approach, standards-based approach. So, you know, uh, we're a Postgres compliant database, right? So you can use the Postgres ecosystem of tools, libraries, frameworks, right? So, you know, if, you're, if I'm a developer and I know how to use Postgres, I can get started with Kinetica immediately, right? Um, and then, you know, we come out of the box with some, uh, tools like a SQL notebook tool that has the WMS mapping capability right there. We have a lightweight BI tool um, that also has that, that server-side rendering mapping capability. And uh, we're also putting out map plugins for all the major BI platforms. So we have one for Tableau, for Superset. Um, we're gonna be putting out one out with Power BI. So, you know, we have an, an engine that's very performant and we have this rendering capability also that's really powerful. So, um, you know, one of the things that uh, we we are focused on is like, you know, you do your analytic where you do your analytic, right? Um, we're not trying to force you to use all of our tools, right? We just want to make sure, you know, we can deliver our value to, you know, to the tool that you're comfortable with. Yeah, that rendering capability is important, right? That's showing you what right. you're looking at, basically. Right. It's a visualization layer. You have that back you build that, right. You guys yeah. built that yourselves. Yeah, yeah, and you have that like back and forth between your map and the other widgets in your dashboard. That's really important, right? Call it like pattern of life analysis, where like you kind of keep digging and, and you know keep um, you know kind of drilling down. Um, you know that's something that's that's crucial for um, a lot of the use cases that, that you know we focus on. You know, it's a uh, it's really powerful to understand like you know customer behavior, even like you know customer three hundred and sixty or fleet behavior. Um, it's something that is important for like uh, data science, where you might be doing data exploration to, to determine what's the right features to use for your model. Um, all those things um, kind of go back to having a really uh, interactive visual experience uh, with the data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you want to be able to zoom in and then zoom out and then zoom in and then zoom out and do that at the speed of thought or at the speed of, of fluid human exploration. Right. And, uh, you know, if your rendering takes too long, you lose that. If your computation takes too long, you, you, you lose that. So you need all of these bits and pieces to be as functional as possible in their domains. And then you bring that together to the user for their experience, right? Right. I mean, like, uh, if you think about like the telcos, right? Like, you know, they look at cell phone tower pings and, you know, understand customer behavior or, you know, they look at uh, where there might be a concentration of activity and, and they have, you know, weak broadband uh, signal strength and they need to place a tower, right? Um, there's all sorts of different things where, you know, in that case, you know, just showing the points doesn't really do much, but like making a heat map is incredibly powerful, right? So um, to be able to show, show the data where the visualization itself is kind of an analytic in its own right as well um, is, is, what, is what's becoming kind of... Uh, what these big enterprises are looking for because they they get it and you know they want to make sure that they're understanding their customer or their fleet or you know whatever they're tracking as best as possible hmm. yeah that's interesting what other data before i give it back to eugene what other data are you pulling in because you know so for example in the airline use case obviously you, you can see radar and you're trying to figure out okay is this that flight is it some other flight is that flight late you know, right. what other kinds of data do you pull in and how do you pull that in? Right. So, you know, uh, it, it's dependent on the customer, but like, you know, a, a lot of these cases, you know, you'll have, like we talked about, like there's that referential data, like flight schedules, right? Um, and then you have like your your high volume sensor streams or, um, you know, your, your real time data that's flowing in. And then you've got, um, and the way it flows in is just, you know, again, we're, we're Postgres compliant, right? So, uh, uh, we can consume at a very, very high volume, like, you know, millions of records a second, but mm -hmm. um, you're still just using all the standard tools that you'd, you'd be uh, accustomed to. Um, and, uh, you know, then it's up to the developer to, to, to say, okay, 
um, I want, you know, I want to deploy this model where I'm, I'm comparing, you know, these, all my breadcrumbs to my flight schedules. Um, and th there's a lot that goes into kind of, you know, not to get too much in the weeds, but like, you know, f flight determination as far as like matching each radar reading to, you know, what flight it actually is. Um, you know, it right. gets, there's a huge, you know, it's kind of called the, like, they call it a tracker, right? And so like Connecticut has its own tracker, but you know, we also work with other trackers and like the, the whole tracker domain is kind of a whole world unto itself. Hmm. Wow. Eugene, I see your wheels turning over there. Yeah, I guess in a past life, I had a challenge kind of brought to me by a product management group where it was a healthcare uh, network delivery company where we built and leased out healthcare provider networks to the big providers like Humana, Anthem, Blue Cross Blue Shields. And one, one of our challenges was to build a network that was adequate, that complied with the CMS adequacy regulations that if you build a network, you have to have providers within X number of miles of your plan participants and they have to be able to actually access your network it has to be adequate enough to provide their service. And we looked at a number of different solutions and we're going to pay several hundred thousand dollars for something that purported to be a solution. We didn't do it because we thought, well, maybe we could build it ourselves. Mm -hmm. So this is geospatial and it is not necessarily real time and not necessarily a high you know, a lot of transactional data, but one of our one of our qualms was, hey, we just paid several hundred thousand dollars to build a cloud data warehouse with mm -hmm. one of the you know flavors of the day, and the executive leadership team was a little bit reluctant to shell out another another couple hundred thousand dollars too. So, if someone brought that kind of problem to you to say, I want to know if something I've built on the ground is just geospatially meeting re requirements, re you know, regulatory compliance requirements in real time. Is that in your sweet spot of yeah. applications to build? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, that type of use case uh, definitely is. I mean, I would say also kind of the uh, that experience uh, is like very, very common right now. I'd, I'd say more common than ever where uh, enterprises have made have made their decisions, uh, you know, their significant decisions around kind of what is their authoritative, you know, cloud data warehouse or, or you know, data warehouse product that is going to lead them for the next, you know, five to 10 years. And, you know, they're looking for um, solutions that work with that, right? So there's very little appetite to, you know, bring in another, another authoritative store. So that's something that we've really focused on is making that very easy. So you know, Snowflake or Databricks, just, you know, having us as a speed layer, you know, that can do that location intelligence or time and space analysis um, to make sure that, um, you know, we're a, an augmentation or a supplementation to their their mm -hmm. their uh, enterprise data investment, right? Um, and, you know, to that particular use case, it kind of goes back to what we've been talking about. You need the, a graph engine to be able to model the road network, right? Because, you know, to have this adequacy, uh, it's about, you're talking about, making sure all the patients can be within a certain drive time of all the, of all the providers. Right. So um, you have that graph network and then you've got folks that sit upon that graph and, you know, you kind of do the, do the graph uh, solve. And then you also, you know, bring in some spatial analysis and OLAP um, and, you know, there's that mixing and matching of, of uh, a compute intensive query that, makes that hard and you know what a lot of enterprises do try to do to solve this is like just like what you guys did is like you know hey we'll just build it ourselves or you know maybe we'll find like a, a vendor that has like a you know kind of a last mile capability for this in particular um and you know usually it, it's it's something where uh trying to build it yourself is just very painful and um you know trying to just find a, a single use application is probably not the best use of capital Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you have no, so if you open up your knife drawer, you see knives of every shape and size. And if you want a bony knife, you don't want a butcher knife, right? And there are certain mm -hmm. applications. So speed layer 
is probably a, a you don't mind that as a description for you. Oh what yeah. You, okay. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we're uh, you know uh, an analytic engine that gives you this compute intensive capability, and you know we've built up a lot of you know. Uh, features that make it easy to act as that speed layer consuming from, you know, your authoritative store. Uh, that's that's where we want to sit in the stack. Yeah, I'd have to imagine you're very useful for things like urban planning, right? Or as far for... as cities, urban planning, um, but also like, you know, our time series capability. Uh, you know, we have some big financial customers where um, they've got, you know, tick data, order data, trade data flowing into mm -hmm. Medica as well as their authoritative store. And then they're doing you know, things like uh, FRTB or, uh, you know, transaction cost analysis, wh whatever you might want to do where data latency needs to be low and, you know, the queries are complex. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I remember learning about a use case. This is probably five, six years ago, interviewing someone from Connecticut, in fact, about the garbage cans all around a particular city. Yeah, and you have okay. sensors in the garbage cans and they will alert you when they know, yeah. hey, we're full now. Right. And it might seem silly, but if you if you're running the budget for the city of New York, let's just say or Boston or any major city, like if I can cut that route time in half and still effectively get all the trash out of there, that's a huge win. I mean, a lot of people don't realize how much money goes into this stuff. And there's a heck of a lot of money that goes in there. So you can learn route optimization. You can save money on not having too many trucks on the streets. Like all these different things are affected by that. But unless you can crunch the numbers, before that driver gets in his truck and gets out on the street, you know, or I guess you can update it as it goes along, you're not gonna be able to solve for that problem, but they can solve it because they have Connecticut at the foundation, right? Right, yeah, I mean, logistics is, uh, can get really complicated. I mean, like the, the Southwest kind of, uh, you know, missed, missed flight problem, right? Where last Christmas they had to take all of these flights out of, out of, uh, out of circulation because they don't have a hub and spoke model. You know, like those are the things that like a, a Connecticut can tackle well because it's got, you know, these solvers um, and, you know, you can interact with them in a way that is, you know, if you know SQL, you, you can, you know, understand how to, to leverage them. Right. Well, and also planning. Like I remember one of the earliest use cases that uh, I learned about, and this is probably 15 years ago now, or maybe 13 years ago, Alteryx, like way back when, one of the cool things that they did was to be able to incorporate third-party data, like mm -hmm. population data, maps back in the day. This is, you know, before everyone had Google Maps, for example. But it becomes very important to know, okay, well, how many people uh, of this income bracket are in this neighborhood? How many people are in that neighborhood? What's it going to cost us to build this new store? What kind of predictions can we get on revenue? Well, all that stuff can really be fed by third-party data, transactional data, predictive algorithms and so on and so forth and you can really get a good high level of confidence okay if you build a target store at lamar and fifth avenue it's going to go somewhere because we've done the numbers on all these people in this in this region that's something else that you guys would be good at right yeah i mean we have an, a number of customers that are uh, data providers themselves right where they're taking um you know raw collections of, of foot traffic you know doing those kind of analytics and and AI that you're talking about and then, you know, uh, selling that back out as data products so that other enterprises can understand the cut their customer better and where they, you know, what their interests might be um, at a given time and location.